Hello, everyone. We're just giving it a minute for all our attendees to come in. It just takes a second for everyone um, to join. So we'll start in a moment here. All right, looks like everyone's in. So welcome everyone to today's online charter series webinar on the Charter's fundamental freedoms, um, particularly focusing on freedom of expression, freedom of peaceful assembly, and touching on freedom of association. So those are all in section two of the charter um, and Alberta's Critical Infrastructure Defense Act um, hosted by the Center for Constitutional Studies at the University of Alberta. We're pleased that you're all joining us today. Uh, my name is Alina Rietzma. I'm the Center's Public Legal Education Coordinator, and I'll be moderating the session. Um, as this is a webinar, many of our, um, our attendees could be watching from across Canada. Some of you may be, even be from various parts of the world. Um, so I'd really encourage you to reflect upon the land at your respective location, wherever you are, and to think on those who came before you, who called and continue to call that land their home. Um, as I respectfully acknowledge that the Center for Constitutional Studies is located on Treaty 6 territory, an ancestral gathering place for the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Soto, and Inuit peoples, and whose histories, languages, and cultures form the structure of our shared vibrant community. So before I introduce um, our guest speaker today, um, Professor Erica Adams, um, I'm just going to go through the format of the webinar for today. So for our attendees, the chat function is disabled, but you can ask questions. You'll see a button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. You can click that and put in uh, your questions there. Uh, one of the differences from our previous webinars for those of you who may have attended before is that you will be able to see other attendees' questions and you can upvote them. So if you see a question that you're interested in uh, or one you're really excited about, you can upvote that and it should move it towards the top of the question list. And there is an option to ask questions anonymously if you'd prefer for your name not to be seen by other attendees. So our speaker today um, is Professor Adams. He's going to speak for about 30 minutes or so. Um, so there should be plenty of time to answer questions after. Uh, once he's done presenting, we're gonna go through all the questions that you've entered and see how many we can get through uh, before 1 p.m. Uh, note that at the end of the webinar, when it closes, you're gonna see a pop-up for a feedback form. Um, if you can, Fill that out, we'd really appreciate that. Um, it's valuable to us to help us improve our webinars. Um, and it's also important for us for reporting for granting as well. Um, lastly, please note the webinar is being recorded. So it's going to be available on our website probably later this week. So the online charter series is intended to provide some information about specific charter sections and context that may be relevant to current issues or events. Um, so as I've mentioned today, Professor Adams is gonna be talking about the charter's fundamental freedoms um, in the context of the Critical Infrastructure Act, um, which was also known as Bill One. Um, and it was and is an act that raises a number of um, questions around constitutionality. And so Professor Adams is gonna address some of those questions today. Um, before I turn things over to him, I'd like to just give you a brief introduction. Um, he is Vice Dean and a Professor of Law at the University of Alberta Faculty of Law and teaches and publishes on matters of constitutional law, legal history, employment law, human rights, and legal education. He's won a number of awards for teaching and research, um, including several articles for his legal historical work, uh, the Provost Award for Early Career Teaching Excellence, and a Killam Annual Professorship in 2016-2017 for excellence in research, teaching and service. He's the lead legal historian on the Shirk funded partnership grant, Landscapes of Injustice, investigating the internment, incarceration, dispossession, and exile of Japanese Canadians during the mid 20th century. And is currently working a manuscript on the history of Canadian constitutional law. Um, and last but not least, he's also been a research fellow um, with our center, the Center for Constitutional Studies since 2015. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn things over to Professor Adams um, to present. Alina, thank you so much. I will um, start by sharing my screen. Can I uh, pull that off? Let's see. Uh, first test of the afternoon. Alina, can you let me know that that has shared? Yes, we see your whole screen, though. So we see your desktop oh. along with the. Uh, 
that's not what I want to have happen. So I failed the first test. Uh, let me try that again. Thank you. Okay. There, yes, now we just see your PowerPoint. Fabulous. Uh, hello, everybody, and thanks for, uh, I would say, normally braving the cold. Um, we don't say that kind of thing anymore because you're, I hope, in your toasty uh, homes uh, watching this over lunch. So hello to all and thanks to the center for asking me to think on these topics. Um, this used to be the, the downtown charter series and I, I like the format because it uh, challenges those of us that, that study and teach in this area to try and, and broaden the lens a little bit for a more general audience to think about constitutional issues that are in the public eye and uh, that have importance for all of us. Um, so I know there are probably uh, students here, uh, maybe some lawyers, but also just uh, folks interested in thinking about uh, some of the constitutional issues that will arise with the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act. And that's what I'll talk about um, today. On Twitter, I think I promised to begin with a, a post-game analysis. And so I'll say, Tom Brady, good at football. Um, constitutional dissent is the topic. And I think it's one that is driven by the, the, the emergence of this uh, particular act, Critical Infrastructure Defense Act, in the sense that the Constitution in its protections of fundamental freedoms envisions a democratic tradition that will be somewhat raucous, that will involve elements of dissent, that will uh, cause individuals and groups to have clashing ideas about uh, the best public policy. And the question is, how broad is that sphere of protection for constitutional dissent? Uh, and when is a government constitutionally authorized to limit uh, the nature and content of that dissent? I think that's the heart of the question as I'll, as I'll talk about. Um, and I think given the trend lines of, uh, of, of public dis displays of, of dissent that we have seen, um, perhaps a fracturing, of, um, of, of, of politics uh, along increasingly intense uh, uh, strands, uh, this is going to be an issue that will continue to animate um, Canadian politics. Okay, so let's uh, advance my slides. That's uh, challenge number two. Uh, I think I've done that hopefully, Alina. And um, it can seem like a long uh, year 2020, uh, when you think back to it. Um, and I was uh, shocked a little bit to discover that, that these episodes were exactly one year ago. They unfolded largely uh, through the end of January and into early to mid-February. And they began with uh, the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs taking a long-standing position that they did not consent to the use of their lands, traditional lands of the Wet'suwet'en people to uh, have the coastal link gas pipeline, which would transport uh, natural gas from uh, fracking activities to uh, Northern British Columbia for export into Asia. The hereditary chiefs uh, of the Wet'suwet'en people, um, or many of the uh, hereditary chiefs, took the position that uh, they did not consent to the building of the pipeline across their territories. There was some division in the community around this uh, question. Um, and in particular a division, I think, uh, between uh, hereditary governance structures and the elected band council um, in, uh, uh, in the Wet'suwet'en nation. When the hereditary chiefs articulated their uh, dissent to uh, the project and its continuation, that sparked a number of, uh, of other protests in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en uh, chiefs who were opposed to the pipeline, um, including uh, across Canada, 
um, but uh, in particularly the blocking of rail, line, rail lines, which occurred um, uh, outside Belleville, um, in, in other parts of Ontario, um, ultimately in, uh, in, in a rail line just outside of Edmonton, in addition to a number of other uh, sites. Those were then reaching their uh, uh, climax in, uh, again, mid-February 2020, if you can believe it. It feels like a million years ago to me, it was uh, 12 months ago. Well, here's what uh, Premier uh, Kenny had to say. Um, I'll let you I'll pause, I'll sip, and you can read the quote from Premier Kenny. Now, these comments were made in the context of, uh, of a continuing uh, public debate around uh, the, not only the coastal pipeline uh, uh, and Witswet territory, but uh, about how to respond and react appropriately or not to uh, protests that uh, interfered with uh, railway lines. And CN, um, uh, I, I think amongst uh, Others, not sure. Uh, I can't remember if Via Rail took these actions or not. But certainly, CN sought various uh, injunctions um, that would remove the protesters and any blockades from rail lines that had stopped the flow of of, of goods. And it, the RCMP, in in some cases, then was tasked with um, with issuing those uh, or enforcing those injunctions on protesters. And it became uh, a, a bit of a delicate question of um, of how and when or if arrests should take place under those, under those court orders. And it was in that context that Premier Kenny, among, among other, uh, some other premiers, um, uh, certainly um, uh, the federal uh, conservative leader, Andrew Scheer took this position, that the rule of law was uh, being broken um, and that there was a crisis in effect in Canada because of the, uh, the, the opposition to uh, energy pro projects would, was leading to this kind of, of dissent uh, and protest, which was, in their view, um, destroying uh, economic value and, uh, and in some cases, maybe. Uh, The legislature, uh, the Minister of Justice at the time, um, Mr. Uh, Schweitzer, um, said it was a time of, uh, in Canada in explaining um, the origins of the bill. Um, simply unacceptable, he said, that uh, infrastructure is being obstructed. Here in the province of Alberta, we expect the rule of law to be upheld. Now, this emphasis on uh, the rule of, of, of law, on, on rule breaking, um, may seem a little ironic in the context of, of February 2021, um, in which uh, different political constituencies, um, uh, ones more in line with uh, the conservative, uh, United Conservative Party of Alberta, um, are engaged in a willful disobedience of uh, COVID restrictions. Um, and you don't hear quite the intensity of rhetoric, I note, um, from uh, uh, the government as to that level of uh, rule of law breaking. Um, that is perhaps uh, ironic, perhaps it's to be um, understood as the nature of the political game. I don't think it will have constitutional implications um, beyond its ironic feature. Okay, so where do we go from uh, here? Well, first let's start with the bill itself. Uh, the act, I should say, 
Um, what does it say? What does it do? How does it do it? Uh, and I apologize here because I'm going to use some legislative uh, language. Uh, this is not poetry, people, um, but I'll give you the straight goods on um, first what, where the law applies. That is, what is critical infrastructure? What are we defending in the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act? Um, let's start there. Uh, and the where, as it turns out, is incredibly broad because I haven't even listed all of the uh, possible locations. Indeed, it is impossible to list all of the possible locations um, in my view for uh, reasons that I'll explain in a moment. Um, but you can get a flavor uh, in the definition of essential infrastructure because uh, the legislation defines essential infrastructure um, in, by listing all of the entities that uh, you now see on your screen. And again, this is only um, some of the listed, but um, effectively uh, painting with a very broad brush, uh, the government attempting to capture um, industrial workplaces of, of all kinds. Uh, and, and it's again, difficult to imagine the kinds of uh, places, um, work sites uh, that, that aren't uh, captured by the, the definition of essential uh, infrastructure. If that's not broad enough, the uh, act also gives uh, itself the power to name individual uh, sites, that is buildings, structures, devices, or other things may be identified in the regulations uh, as also being defined as essential uh, infrastructure. So the list uh, is capable of expansion um, not through debate in uh, the legislature, but through a regulatory power um, that the act gives the uh, uh, governor in council. Um, the list is also broader than it may seem because in some cases, um, the terminology used to describe say a, a highway in the act incorporates the definition of highway in other acts. Um, and doing so here, when you go to those other acts, you then catch a flavor of how broadly something like highway is defined um, for the purposes of the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act. So what does a highway include? Well, if you went to another statute, you would discover that uh, the defini definition of a highway includes streets, roads, trails, sidewalks, ditches, um, essential infrastructure, a ditch, according to the act, yes, uh, and areas between um, the fence and uh, a highway. Um, so again, you get a flavor here that what we're talking about is uh, an incredible uh, volume of places, uh, a, a diversity of places, it's hard to connect all of the theories of these various industrial work sites and the um, passageways between them. And that uh, a good deal of this also would be uh, what, what is traditionally thought of as, as public uh, property. That is um, clearly uh, you know, the center of, of somebody's uh, uh, agricultural uh, production facility is, is very, very likely private, um, but uh, there are many, uh, things listed here, which would long be have been considered essentially public in nature. That is, public normally has access to highways, roads, sidewalks, um, and it's a little bit unclear um, when a, a say pipeline um, is is protected as essential infrastructure. Um, just how broadly uh, surrounding that pipeline um, would be the uh, capture. Uh, the land captured by this act. The short story, it applies to a lot of places. Okay, um, what, what is prohibited in those places? Um, and this uh, is legislative language that I'll no quote for you. Um, it says that no person shall, and here's an important phrase, without lawful right justification or excuse, willfully enter on any essential infrastructure. So that is, I think, if we put this in um, regular everyday language, uh, you can't be 
around essential infrastructure if you're not supposed to be there. If you're not, if you don't have the right justification or excuse, uh, then uh, you've committed an offense simply by um, being there. Um, now, what is also prohibited then is, again, I've, I've exempted out the without lawful right justification or excuse, but that is thread through the prohibitions, uh, that you cannot damage or destroy any essential uh, infrastructure. And I've highlighted some, I think, key phrases in subsection three in which uh, persons can no longer, cannot obstruct, interrupt, or interfere with the construction, maintenance, use, or operation of any essential infrastructure in a manner that renders the infrastructure dangerous, useless, inoperative, or ineffective. Now, those are all necessary uh, conditions, um, but it does, in the language, suggest some, I think, a breadth, because you could imagine that uh, a great deal of constitutional dissent of protest has the purpose of interfering or interrupting the use and operation of places that the, is the subject of the protest. That is that strike activity uh, and political opposition is often expressed through trying to slow down uh, individuals from reaching a work site. Um, that, that slowing down can often just sometimes be a fa factor of the, of the assembly of people. Um, it becomes slower to get through to the, the, the infrastructure itself. Um, that may well be captured by an interruption um, that l renders the site less effective. Um, it'll slow work shifts uh, and perhaps deliveries um, from those workplaces. You cannot uh, counsel anyone to infringe any of the prohibitions listed above. And you cannot use false uh, means or identification to enter those workplaces. Um, so again, the, 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 the breadth of the uh, locations is, is then plays out, I think, meaningfully when you, de when you determine that, that the prohibitions also have breadth to them. Um, now, they may well capture some uh, activity uh, that is uh, lawfully prohibited um, by a provincial government. So, you know, individual um, destroying uh, a factory and its uh, machines uh, for uh, political purposes, uh, it seems to me may, may well, we'll talk about it in a minute, but it may well be within the bounds of what a, a, a government uh, for good reason can restrict. Um, but when we talk about uh, interrupting and interfering uh, with uh, the array of sites uh, designated as essential infrastructure, um, then I think we uh, enter into a, another realm entirely as, as I'll expand upon. What uh, happens if you have uh, engaged in any of that prohibited conduct? Uh, the penalties are uh, stiff. Um, they include uh, fines, which are potentially uh, large on individuals, up to $10,000, but also imprisonment of six months. You can combine those fines. And uh, every uh, day uh, that the protest continues, uh, the act defines as a subsequent uh, offense uh, giving rise to potentially cumulative uh, penalties uh, under the act. Uh, it can be enforced by uh, peace officers, says the act, who may arrest without warrant any person uh, that the peace officer finds contravening the act. That would suggest that arrests can occur um, by individuals uh, interfering or interrupting um, at uh, a large number of sites of work. All right, I want to uh, talk about uh, the rights that are brought to the fore by this act. And the first is uh, the right of freedom of assembly. 
I'm sometimes called the forgotten freedom or one of the forgotten freedoms in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. There is very little uh, case law, a small handful, um, no serious treatment by the Supreme Court of Canada of what the freedom of assembly is or the ways in which it may um, uh, protect certain kinds of activities or not others. Its origins lie in um, the medieval crown, don't they all? Um, in the sense that the, 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 the English law recognized the right to the crown as a way of, of reconciling sovereign power with help that, that, that would want to uh, express dissatisfaction. And without the mechanism to express that data dissatisfaction, it could give rise to revolt and insurrection and instability. And so the law came to recognize that individuals had a right to express through what was in the English law called petition um, to the crown. And for a long time, this right of petitioning was thought to be an individual right. But petitioners began to say, um, our petition has more meaning when it is uh, collectively expressed. So the right to petition began to be framed through the centuries as also a collective right to complain, to protest, to gather, to dissent. Um, whether the British recognized that collective right or not in their British common law constitution was an issue of some uh, debate. So uh, one of the famous uh, British writers of the constitution, A.B. Dicey, in his uh, work in the uh, 19th century said, there is no right to a peaceful assembly in British constitutional law. There may, there may be an individual right um, that, that courts may grant individuals, but certainly no, no collective uh, right. Well, uh, the Americans um, who uh, forged their constitutionalism in the very act of dissent um, take a different approach. That is that, that peaceful assembly, assembly um, that petitioning collectively is essential to uh, democratic uh, constitutional freedoms of a, of a free society. And so it's no surprise that peaceful assembly is articulated in the First Amendment of the US Constitution Bill of Rights. And it was well expressed during the, um, during the, the, the constitutional debates, debates that led to the American Constitution that assembly was um, critical. My final image is, is of the, the, the anti-corn law uh, riots in, in, in England because as, as much as the UK decided that they, they wanted to, uh, or the, that the law would or would not recognize the right of gathering um, to, to affect uh, political uh, messages, um, it just keeps happening. Uh, the public will assemble. A, an assembling public has always been a feature of what it means to be democratically engaged. So whether you recognize that right or not, um, it is going to occur on the, on the ground. The assembly rights then in some ways dovetail with the recognition of, of freedom of expression in Canadian law, which has received a great deal more uh, treatment in the case law, both before and after the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And two wonderful quotes from two early 20th century cases articulate one from Alberta, one from Quebec, just how central debate, dissent is to, um, for Justice Duff, the quote from the reference for Alberta statutes, to the democratic foundations of constitutional government. And what I like especially about that quote is the recognition uh, in the quote itself that it's a messy business allowing uh, free public dis discussion of public affairs. There are incidental mischiefs which, uh, which result from the free public discussion of public affairs. Nonetheless, we accept those mischiefs because of the connection to uh, our democracy. And Justice Rand, who writes this quote in, in Boucher and the King, 
talks not only about democracy, but of ourselves. Um, this is something essential to our lives. It has a purpose in our democratic fulfillment, but it's also something inherent in ourselves. To gather, to speak, and to express our views really is an element of our humanity. And so the protection then of assembly and of free speech, not surprisingly, is captured in um, the West's most important um, constitutional rights instruments from the American Bill of Rights to the Universal Declaration, the Canadian Bill of Rights, the Alberta Bill of Rights, first enacted in 1972, and of course, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, among others all recognize the distinct rights of assembly and freedom of expression. In the, pardon the phone call, in the debates leading up to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, the rights of assembly and association had been conjoined as they, as they are in the, in the Canadian Bill of, of Rights. And in the, in the joint committee hearings leading to the passage of the charter, it was felt that these two needed these two rights were independent of one another and needed to be separately expressed. And that's precisely what happened in section two. So we now have listed as our fundamental freedoms, freedom of conscience and religion, which I have not listed, but freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression of peaceful assembly as a distinct uh, 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 fundamental freedom and freedom of association. I won't talk a lot about the differences between assembly and association. Um, freedom of association has also been one of the issues raised in relation to this act, more directly connected in my view to the labor relations uh, context, not exclusively, but often thought of as being a part of um, the rights associated with the labor movement to collectively bargain, to withdraw their labor and to um, make representations uh, political or otherwise uh, um, about issues that are important to uh, working uh, people. But of course, rights are not um, absolute uh, as we know, and section one will allow for reasonable limits in a free and democratic society, provided they can be, I think crucially, demonstrably justified. Put the government to the test. If you're gonna limit rights, explain why you're doing it, and explain why you're doing it in this way. Freedom of expression then, I think is clearly engaged by the act. Uh, and here's why. The test for freedom of expression as developed in jurisprudence, uh, the cases of this Canadian Supreme Court effectively ask these four questions. Is the activity intended to convey meaning? And critically, the court has taken a very broad view of what constitutes expressive activity. Not just the things you say, but the actions you undertake to express meaning or to attempt to convey meaning. So in that light and in that definition, clearly elements and examples of protest, of gathering, of dissent, um, of opposition, um, all are captured, interfering with a project uh, with, whom you with which you politically disagree is expressive activity. And so it's not only the things you say about opposing that pipeline, it's the things you do to oppose that pipeline that are protected expressive activity. There might be some places, say the courts, where expressive activity is not fully protected. And I'm gonna suggest that my living room is one of those places, as I often tell my two children. Uh, so we don't always have the full ambit of our expressive rights everywhere that we go. But the court has said we must have them in those places, in those public places where we might reasonably and traditionally expect free, freedom of expression to exist. So I'm gonna come back to things like highways, outside parking lots, um, thoroughfares, public places, sidewalks, where individuals can and should expect to be able to 
express themselves and their views. Are limits on those rights reasonable? And they may be, as we'll talk about. So again, it's important to say that you have rights, but the government has the ability to limit them and may do so if they've got a justified reason for it. Okay, let me talk then about the heart of this case. Um, first of all, I wanna thank a couple of the lawyers um, who have uh, issued uh, some challenges to the case, um, have shared some of uh, the, the claims with me. So we know that um, the Alberta Union of Public Employees has constitutionally challenged the legislation as has the Onion Lake Cree First Nation. There are a number of challenges that are being uh, uh, levied against this act. Several of these, most of these, I will not go into unless you wanna ask me about them in the questions. One is that the Alberta government does not have the division of powers jurisdiction to enact this law because this is properly criminal law or that when you legislate in relation to pipelines and highways, things that cross borders, you're entering into federal jurisdiction, another federalism argument. Charter arguments that circle around section two, section seven, um, fundamental uh, uh, liberties, um, presumption of innocence under section 11, and um, treaty rights protected by section 35, all of these are uh, being raised in one form or, or another. I wanna talk about what I see as the heart of this issue in, in my minutes remaining, which is how do you conceive of dissent? Is it, is, it, is it necessary for a vibrant democracy or is it law breaking mobs? And what, is, what are the dividing lines that will distinguish vibrant democratic dissent, which may be, me which may be messy, which may be inconvenient, which may have mischiefs from law-breaking mobs, which are dangerous and unsafe and impact others' rights and freedoms and destabilize uh, the nation in a way that has uh, extensive deleterious and negative effects. I don't think anyone watching the, the shocking views outside Capitol Hill um, last month thought that that was a full express, well, some will be of a different view, but for my money, um, when you have a group that is overtaking the Capitol building, you're no longer in the realm of peaceful assembly that cannot be restricted by properly constitutional law. So how do you frame, how do you understand, how do you understand who is entitled to dissent and in what ways and to what extent and how inconvenient can that dissent uh, be in a constitutional society committed to rights and freedoms. Another issue I think that is interesting is can the law or should the law be saved through interpretation? So I talked about the ways in which the law is broadly drafted, interfering, interrupting, ineffective. What do those words mean um, in the context of dissent and protest? Will only the most, uh, will they be set at a high threshold in that only the most uh, destructive elements of, of protest are captured? Or does it extend to simply uh, petitioning, handing out a leaflet, slowing down a vehicle? Um, those are matters of interpretation that the court will be faced with. And one possibility is the court says, we should be preferring a constitutional interpretation. So we are going to read down this legislation to very extreme levels of conduct. That might be one way to save the law from unconstitutional application. And we've seen the court use this technique in hate speech, for example, um, in, um, in uh, child uh, spanking uh, provisions in the criminal code um, uh, and, and in child pornography uh, and, and possession of child pornography provisions in the criminal code. In all of those cases, the court said, let's read the provisions narrowly to preserve constitutional 
uh, rights of expression or otherwise. Is that appropriate here? And what about the polar vortex chill? That is, it's all well and good for a court to say that we are giving a narrow interpretation, but some concept of the rule of law has to also include the idea that a citizen can read the law and know what conduct is constitutional, legal, or illegal. And using vague terminology like interrupt, interfere, ineffective, may not provide the clarity to citizens in advance of a protest that they want to hold. If, as I think will occur, the law will be found to have interfered with expressive freedoms and uh, uh, the right of peaceful assembly, then can the government justify the law's breadth of its application and activities as reasonable limits? Well, and again, in, in my view, there may be much in the law that could be justified, um, particularly uh, the prohibitions on uh, destructive activities in particular. Um, but how can the law, how can the, how can the government def justify the breadth in terms of the physical localities and some of the ambiguities around those physical localities? I think they will be very hard pressed to do so. And secondly, the extent of the prohibitions, it seems to me extend far beyond what is reasonable for a government to accept in order to achieve its goal of a functioning Canadian economic system. Surely safety at work, a basically functioning economy of trade are going to be requirements that a court would say can justifiably infringe rights. But, but are those objectives being uh, proportionally protected with a total prohibition on interfering activities? I think that's the question that the, the court will um, wrestle with. So again, just to come back to the, the, the breadth of that law, um, I think there will be uh, locations that the, the court struggles to uh, find uh, reasonable um, given the purposes of the act. And if we come back to the, the language of the act itself, section two, three in particular, it seems to me casts a net broader than the government um, I think can reasonably justify. In a world in which we are uh, living increasingly with uh, labels of, of lawbreakers and enemies, I think it's important as citizens to try and come back to the essence of what it means to live in a society, a productive, so a productive society capable of constitutional dissent. When we lose the ability to, to disagree with one another lawfully, and productively, we lose something that's essential to our dem democratic lives. Okay, I'm happy to um, end there and to take uh, thoughts and questions as they may arise. Thank you so much. Um, so just a reminder for all our attendees, you can ans sorry, ask questions um, by clicking the Q&A button. Um, be aware that unlike our previous webinars, other people will be able to see your questions. Um, you can ask them anonymously and um, we also have what's called upvoting. So if someone, um, if you think there's a question that you think is really important, you have the same question, you can have it um, show up higher on our list. Um, so it looks like so far we have one question here. It's just a little bit long, so I'm just gonna go through it. Um, Okay, so it says, um, I'm reading I, it, uh, Lena. So. Okay, perfect. But maybe I'll, and I guess all our attendees can see it, but I'll read it out just in case maybe somebody's not able to read it. Um, it, it says, thank you for your talk. I understand beginning this talk with background and relating to Wet'suwet'en as it is an important aspect for why the legislation from Alberta comes forth. Thus, I'm wondering why, if you bring up the Wet'suwet'en aspect of this bill, the background decision of Delgamuk and the utilization of Canada's national interests as the terminology to override Indigenous rights and titles not highlighted. I believe Kenny also used this term national interest to push this legislation. 
Thus, why no discussion section relation to sections 25 and 35 of the Constitution and Charter, especially since this is intertwined with existing Indigenous rights and descent. Um, I also terminology relating to elected or democratically elected band council when it's a unilateral system forced upon First Nations with very undemocratic rules in place to make them only accountable to Indigenous services and Crown Indigenous relations slash Canada. So there's a lot there. Thanks for the question, um, Mr. Cowie. A whole talk could be given on all of the um, indigenous rights implications in relation to this particular law. So one might approach it in terms of the, the conflict itself that gave rise to the law and the, 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 uh, the conflict in Wet'suwet'en territory, that in itself could be given a Full analysis, the subject of a book, um, and the the constitutional rights claim under Section 35, treaty rights, um, could also stand alone as its own um, talk. That just wasn't my particular focus. Not because I don't think those issues are unimportant, or that um, that uh, they they may not be uh, as valid as uh, the the charter claims, but I was just interested in the little more little known aspect of the rights of uh, assembly in particular, and how, what that might say in relation to this particular act. So um, I encourage future uh, speakers to devote the attention to the, all those topics. They are good ones. So it looks like we have a bit of a response and a question I think coming off of that. It says, the analysis you've given is based on Canadian constitutional law. The Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs, or at least some of them took the position that their laws governing their territory were ignored. To your knowledge, are any of the challenges dealing with the independent Indigenous constitutional jurisdiction? Yeah, thanks. Um, and again, it's it's important to remember that that the, the the facts that gave rise to the origins of this act occurred in British Columbia about a pipeline project, and it's really um, then not within the scope of this particular law because of of where it's located. So. The idea that uh, this particular this particular act will not apply to the Wet'suwet'en people and won't apply to the Coastal Link uh, gas challenge, but I think it was intended to apply to future protests, indigenous or otherwise, that may surround um, industrial projects in Alberta, and uh, one of the challenges um, of the Onion Lake uh, Cree Nation that I've seen certainly raises. Uh, sovereignty issues around uh, treaty rights and um, uh, around whether or not the government can um, prohibit uh, dissent from Indigenous peoples uh, in the way that uh, the bill purports to do, or whether or not those are inherent rights, both of sovereignty or of, of treaty. And so that those issues are going to be debated in this uh, legislation, it seems to me, as well. Okay, so the next question we have is, do you think a court would take into account the political aspects slash background of the act, perhaps targeting UCP political opponents when balancing in a section one analysis? I don't um, think so. I, I th obviously the, uh, to the extent that the um, origins of the act and the statements made around it uh, have bearing on the, the pith and substance of the act. That's what lawyers would say is the, the essence of the act. Um, th to that extent, there, I think, will be some um, utility of, of that political context. Trying to figure out exactly why does this act exist? What was the intention of the government in creating it? And so debates in Hansard, uh, comments uh, from the Minister of Justice and Premier uh, I think will be part of understanding what the essence of that law is. And some of those comments, I think, will be used by opponents of the act to say that that really the essence of this act is criminal in nature. And I think even in one of the quotes that I put up, um, uh, Premier Kenny refers to the, you know, the idea that the police need to, to step up their enforcement, the idea that, that this is a moral wrong uh, and that wrongdoing needs to be punished to the extent that there is that commentary, uh, I think lawyers will, will argue that this is in essence um, criminal law. I, I'm not sure that that particular argument will succeed. It seems to me that there is a, a provincial aspect in 
in regulating uh, industrial activity um, in the province, but that will be an argument. I'm not sure how it will pan out. All right, so we have another question. I think it's similar to some of the other questions we had. Is that would the constitution not be a lawful excuse to enter most of these areas? Would this impact the assessment of the law's constitutionality? So I'm not sure I understood that one, uh, Alina. I think what they're saying is because there's that um, condition that can't be in those places without lawful excuse, so on and so forth, they're wondering if you could argue that the constitution, I guess your rights are a lawful excuse. I think is right. how I understand the question. Right. Um, well, I th that definition of, of lawful excuse, I think is going to be one that's uh, important in determining the, the precise scope of the legislation. It's one that I think opponents of the act who are challenging it will say is not capable of precise uh, definition or understanding from individuals that may be the subject to this law and you raise one of the arguments. So, you know, if I have a constitutional right to protest, maybe that gives me a lawful excuse to, um, to, to be on these premises. Um, I, and I, I, I don't know the answer to that, except that um, it seems to me that the, the court also wants to protect some notion alongside of freedom of expression and freedom of assembly, some notion also of private property, of um, orderly business. So it can't be that every individual has the right to place themselves in the center of every uh, private uh, factory um, coal mine. Um, I, I don't think a court is gonna find that that is uh, what the constitution entails. So again, what's the definition of how broadly or how, how extensive is your constitutional right to place yourself in the proximity of industrial sites? I think that is the heart of the question. Looks like the next question we have at the top here is if courts across the country continue to issue injunctions to clear rail and pipeline blockades, and none of these injunctions have been held on unconstitutional or judges have rejected constitutional rights arguments before issuing them, why would we expect a court to hold this legislation unconstitutional? Isn't the legislature just doing what courts already allow companies to do? That's, uh, that's a great question. So it seems to me to be entirely different uh, in the context of an injunction that surrounds a particular railway blockade. Um, so if an individual has constructed a, or individuals have constructed a blockade of a railway, uh, they are clearly exercising constitutional rights of expression and assembly. CN comes and says, this is our private track. We can't function with this blockade in our railway. It's not safe for our workers. It's not safe to dismantle uh, the structures. It's not safe for the protesters who, uh, who are too close to the tracks um, and may be injured. All of these arguments say CN, in addition to our need to function as a business, means that this blockade has to come down. Um, a court is gonna issue that blockade uh, or issue that injunction. Uh, to dismantle that blockade, um, even though there are rights implicated uh, in doing so. Why is that different from the Critical Infrastructure Act? Because the Critical Infrastructure Act, it seems to me, is not about a blockade. It's not about a blockade over a particular railway. It is a blanket prohibition on activities, many of which may fall well short of a dump truck parked across a rail line. Um, and that's when I refer you to the language of interference, interrupting, um, and ineffectiveness as being the standard that the, that the, the blockade uh, or, the, or that the, the act is articulating. Um, and we know from um, 25 years of, of cases around, uh, around picketing that courts, I think, uh, properly so, have a tolerance for, for the ways in which picketing and protesting may slow things down sometimes in the name of constitutional rights. 
All right, so the next question we have at the top here is, do you expect constitutional decisions around this act to have implications on laws creating bubble zones around abortion clinics, such as the NDP's Bill 9 from 2018? That's a great question. Um, I don't know that I've off the cuff I can I can think that one through. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna exercise my right to pass on that one because I I'm just not sure I can see all the uh, connections. But um, it's a good question. I'll keep thinking. The next question we have is: Are there a few Supreme Court decisions or appellate decisions on Section One in the context of an attempt to justify restrictions on freedom of expression and assembly that you would recommend to give a sense of how the courts look at the balancing of interests? Yeah, it's a great uh, a great question. The, the again, the the assembly um, jurisprudence is so thin that it's, it's hard to come up with great uh, examples. And the pre-charter examples, uh, DuPont um, and Montreal being the most famous uh, uh, 1978 decision of the Supreme Court was ultimately not uh, protecting of uh, the rights of assembly in that, in that case, the city of Montreal banning, um, banning street demonstrations if and around uh, in the late 1960s um, as a result of the FLQ. Um, the, the expression um, jurisprudence, of course, is much more robust. And, um, you know, the Montreal, again, Montreal seems to be a hot zone, but um, the Montreal uh, case, um, maybe I even have it, um, 2005, Supreme Court of Canada, 62, um, is, uh, again, I think shows the, the, the court's approach to expression in, in public and quasi-public uh, places, um, maybe a good place to start. Thank you. So it looks like the top question we have right now is just asking for some clarification around the ground. So it says, are the current cases challenged in the Constitution of Bill 1 based on the right to freedom of peaceful assembly, or what are the grounds that these claims are basing their challenges on? Yes, at least the claims I have seen raise a number of constitutional issues uh, to challenge the act. Um, and of course, that's often a constitutional strategy uh, is to uh, have a number of horses in the race. Uh, the horses in this race are freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, section seven rights to life, liberty and security of the person. Um, there may well be section 15 um, uh, arguments that I haven't seen yet um, and, and some section 35 claims. Okay, and I think the, the top two questions are related, although it's changing a little bit as people upvote. Um, so the first question we have on the top here is, as you noted, the principal gripe of the UCP was that the police did not go in and remove the protesters. That is, enforce the rule of law as they saw it. Given the distinct role of attorneys general and the ministers of justice, will this be interpreted as impermissible interference and in what um, I thought at least should be a neutral enforcement or application of the law? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I don't have at my fingertips, I guess, all of the, that commentary. And I, um, so I don't know how cautious the uh, political actors were. Um, sometimes they exercise caution in emphasizing the distinctive role between government and the decisions around enforcement of laws. At other times, they are less precise um, about those distinctions. And uh, there is always a, a, a danger, as you as you suggest, in which the enforcement of law becomes politicized, um, and we should all be uh, guarding strongly against that um, that trend as as well. All right, let's tuck one more question here. So the the final question is: What's the likelihood the Alberta government will amend the act by invoking Section thirty three of the Charter to shield the act? Oh, that's a great question. I haven't seen that uh, floated. Uh, maybe, maybe it has been. Um, certainly, we've seen a stronger uh, interest in Section 33 uh, in the last five years, um, especially among conservative governments than we we saw in the, in, in in previous uh, versions. I know, again, um, Premier Klein sometimes. Uh, uh, throughout test balloons about invoking section 33. 
but really for about the last 20 years um, until a few years ago, it was not thought of as a really political viable uh, uh, option for governments. That I think has changed slightly. Obviously section 33 invoked by the Quebec government in relation to its uh, ban on um, religious coverings, um, invoked uh, in Saskatchewan in relation to some religious uh, religious uh, education rights. Um, Premier Ford was prepared to invoke it in um, Ontario in relation to uh, his uh, democratic redistrict redistricting. Um, and so might the UCP be uh, open to considering section 33? I suppose it's probably not off the table completely, um, but I might be surprised if it shows up in this particular case. Well, thank you so much, um, Professor Adams, and thank you to our attendees. And I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of the questions. There were a number of other questions, but um, we're out of time at this point. So thank you so much, Professor Adams, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us and taking the time to answer um, our attendees' questions. Um, we're really thankful that you were able to, to come here today, or I guess come here virtually, um, and, and share your time with us. So we appreciate that. Um, I'd also really like to thank Patricia Paradis, our executive director, and Zara Ahmed, who's our administrator, who both helped with organizing, advertising, and preparing for this webinar, um, as always. Um, and thank you so much for all the attendees, for all of you who showed up today, um, for your interest, for your attendance. I hope that you found this webinar interesting um, and that it increased your understanding of the Charter's fundamental freedoms. Um, I will say we have another online charter series lined up on February 24th, discussing section one of the charter, the balancing provision. You heard a little bit about it today. So keep your eyes open for our social media, your inboxes if you're on our, our mailing lists and our website. Um, and just so you know, the webinar from today will be available on our website soon. It's been recorded. And lastly, just a reminder, when we end the webinar um, for our attendees, there will be a feedback form. And we'd really appreciate it if you could fill that out um, because it helps us um, have a, a sense of our funding as well as our future programming. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Professor Adams. Thank you everyone for coming today. Take care.